The webinar is presented by our consultant Juan Carlos. Uh, and please note the audio is through WebEx. There are no dial-in numbers. And please feel free to send us a message through the chat um, uh, if you have any questions. What we will do is collate the questions at the end and, and answer them all together. Um, and in the meantime, obviously, you're free to send the questions through chat. Um, I'll take a moment now to introduce Juan, and then we can get started. Juan is our um, APC consultant, several years of experience in um, implementing advanced process control projects. He has a bachelor's and a master's degree in chemical engineering and really uh, has uh, worked in several different um, countries on several different processes and specifically has done uh, optimization work on utilities. Uh, so I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Juan to present this uh, webinar to you. So over to you, Juan. Thank you, Sam. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, this is the agenda of the webinar for today. We'll have a bit of an introduction of what ITCAS is, very brief, and then we'll go on our topic of interest, which will be the optimization of utilities and steam networks. We'll take the two approaches to it that uh, we work on which is the base layer, uh, which is DCS optimization, and the MPC plus APC optimization. Then at the end, as Sam just said, we'll have a round of questions. For the past 19 years, IPCAS has been providing industry specialized expert services and people for PAD tuning and advanced process control. In doing that, we have developed our own software uh, for a different uh, for different uh, purposes. We have our set of the art. Inca Aptitude, which is our PAD tuning software, which we use uh, in pretty much every single project we are involved in. It's a very good software that can uh, tackle multiple interactive PAD tuning problems. If you have interacting loops, it will it will for sure give you a much better. Uh, tuning that you can ever try to do manually. It checks robustness for the PAD chip for, for the loops. Next year, since we had received a lot of feedback from our customers, we will implement automatic cascade loop handling. And we also have our own MPC software. It's a multivariable control, multivariable predictive control software is model-based, constraint handling, predictive, which we have used in several locations for making uh, APC projects. Okay, so let's get to the bottom of this. Let's start with uh, base layer optimization. This, everything we're saying, although it's, uh, we're trying to make it as specific, for our topic at hand, it is of course applicable to any other case. So we have four uh, very important things to know regarding base layer optimization. First one, the current control strategy you have on your DCS or PLC it may not be the optimal, which means that you can always improve in your control strategy. That can be done 
through ARC, which are advanced regulatory control solutions, like uh, cascades, split ranges, or uh, any other type of advanced regulatory control uh, strategies, all of those can greatly improve your operation. Also, you have to take into account that a robust and optimal PAD tuning is critical because the optimization of any process can only be done with good control. We have our first case of study in a utilities plant in France. Here we did a base layer improvement. It could was asked to improve the cold fluid ice bed steam boiler performance by re enabling the unused but existent base layer control. This is, in other words, saying that almost every single PAD loop was in manual. And uh, attempts to make them work were had not been successful, but it had been able to re-enable the whole uh, base layer system. So this is a schematic of the of the process at hand is the cold fluidized bed boiler. As you hear see here we have a a cold bed which is fed through um, conveyor belts, and this uh, coal is burned to generate the heat needed to uh, produce 40 bar steam. This uh, has a lot of complications inside, like for example, controlling the combustion of the coal itself is not easy. And also, <coughs> you need to adjust uh, the amount of coal burned uh, depending on the demand of the network. So that's why we see the following uh, base layer strategies implemented there. First one is the pressure, steam pressure controller. That pressure controller is basically acting on the load controller, which is uh, a, a steam flow controller, setting a, a load signal to the coal uh, feed and to the air. We also have our combustion control, which is a uh, fluidized bed temperature control. Basically, it is controlling the temperature of the bed by recycling some of the fumes, because the fumes are almost depleted on oxygen, so that helps control the combustion. And we also have an an excess O2 control, which is basically a trim control, since the load controller is already setting the main amount of air being fed to the uh, boiler. Well, that trim control is done via the secondary air inlet. And uh, we also have uh, this superheated this superheated control here, which is basically controlling the um, the, the temperature of the, the superheated temperature of the steam. And finally, we have the typical three element level control for the steam drum. Again, except for the level control, all of the other controllers were in manual. So we're all the time be, having needed to be adjusted manually by the operators. So every time there were uh, changes in the demand of the network, well, manual adjustments had to be done, which uh, resulted in big disturbances. So again, 
The scene pressure controller was in manual. That, of course, led to network instability. The fluidized bed temperature in manual again. That led to poor combustion conditions. The steam flow, again, as we said, which, is, which was basically the load controller to the boiler, was in manual. So there were no automatic load adjustments, no response to changes in demand of the network. The primary air was in manual, which meant that uh, the combustion fluidization did not follow the load. Uh, there were poor settings in the XSO2 trim control, leading to a lot of excess air being fed to the boiler, resulting in low efficiency, too much air to be heated. And the superheated temperature control, we, there was a problem with the control valve there, and no real control was uh, really being done. So that led to poor heat recovery and uh, poor quality of the steam. So what is it that we do? We, what we did was the following. We pretty much took a systematic approach. Uh, we first started uh, looking at the base of the base, which means the slave loops of all the strategies we just showed. We looked at those slave loops, uh, look at the instrumentation, and once we were able to grant proper performance in those single control strategies by means of PAD tuning or uh, instrument uh, fixing, then we moved on to the advanced control strategies advanced regulatory control strategies, the, the, the master loops, which we also tuned. Always taking into account that for lots of them, uh, there, were, there was uh, interaction. For dealing with that interaction, we used our software Aptigen, which is uh, specifically designed to give the best possible PAD tuning when you have interacting loops by respecting constraints. Here are the results. Again, everything was in manual before, so what you see here is that uh, the process variable in each case, this specific one, the steam pressure, was just floating, floating around, no real control, just manual adjustments, as you see here. And after uh, we did the improvements, we were able to uh, put the loop in automatic and make it control tightly. This was uh, primarily done by either by, by, by tuning and also by um, re-enabling the master load controller. As a result of this, uh, the steam flow, which is the load controller, as we just said, the load controller, uh, before it was, again, just floating around. And then after, with adjustments and tuning, we were able to uh, make it work again in automatic and have it tightly controlled, which at the end was uh, nothing different than a, a load control responding to the demand of the network. Same thing with the fluidized, uh, fluidized bed temperature. Before, the process variable was just floating, just manual adjustments on the recycle fume flow, but not real control. You see how we have changes of around 40 degrees on that bed temperature. That, of course, led to uh, problems in the combustion. The combustion was not properly done. This can also lead to higher emissions. So after we re-enabled the controller, we were able to tightly control the 
fluid ice bed temperature. By doing all the above, all, uh, all the things we did, we noticed that we could also uh, adjust the trim control on the excess O2 on the excess oxygen because now that we had control on other parts of the boiler, it was possible then to reduce the amount of secondary air fed to the boiler. That led to a dramatic reduction on the XO2 from, from an average of 6% to around 2.5%, which uh, is per se an increase in the efficiency of the boiler. And on the deep superheater temperature, as uh, we said before, the, uh, they had issues with the control valve. Uh, we recommended them to make adjustments and changes on the instrumentation for uh, fixing the valve. And this is the before and the after. Before, it, it, it was, there was pretty much no real control variations of around 15 degrees in the the superheater temperature and after we had we had a very tight control of the superheater temperature which is uh, a good measurement of the quality of the steam produced is not only the amount or even the pressure is also the quality in this superheater temperature is uh, very important for the downstream operations. So from the from the previous slides we, we were able to conclude that several PAD loops have been tuned and were taken successfully in auto mode. Uh, this again was done using a very systematic approach in which we started from the very basis up. That is really important in any single case. We also were able to reduce the fluctuations, the variations in steam pressure and flow. This all because of all the control uh, systems were re-enabled and now the load controller was really changing the amount of coal and the amount of air being fed uh, to the boiler in respect to the demand of the network. And the improvements, the improvements enabled a reduction in excess oxygen from, again, a, from 6% to 2.5%. It's a dramatic reduction which will really save uh, on uh, coal because the efficiency in the boiler increases in this case. We had also a very good experience doing uh, MPC, APC optimization. For MPC, what is important to know is the following. The base layer control for the specific case of uh, utilities and steam, net, steam networks is not always enough when, all, when optimizing utility systems. What we just did before was optimizing or improving the behavior, the performance of one single boiler. But in most of the places, in most of the facilities, you don't have a single boiler. You typically have a rack of several boilers, which you need to control. And the local optimum of that boiler is probably not the global optimum of the whole rack of boilers. In which case, you need a different approach. You need a different tool, something uh, with more capability. This is where a multivariable approach will give you the flexibility you need to control the utility system. This will allow you to uncover most of your utility system potential. Sometimes, probably, you're not producing enough steam, not because you don't have the install capacity, that's probably because you're constrained on some you're constrained on your system that probably can uh, give much more. Uh, almost as a rule, reductions in emissions and energy consumption are 
amongst the most common benefits when you do uh, an MPC project on a set of steam boilers. Our specific case for this uh, MPC optimization was an utilities plant and steam, and steam, sorry, steam network in Italy. IPCUS was asked at that time to improve the steam network and the power generation, not only steam network, also the power generation performance by reducing the energy waste, lots of venting, and stabilizing the pressure of the high pressure, medium pressure, and low pressure steam headers. This is how the process looks like, or looks like. Um, it's, uh, as you see, we have a cogenerator, which is a gas turbine, generated electricity using fuel gas. We have the gas turbine, com combined with, with the boiler, a typical cogeneration uh, setup, in which the exhaust gas is used as heating medium as well to generate the steam. In this case, they generated 48 bar steam. They also had an auxiliary boiler whenever the demand was uh, high. And they had two um, steam turbines to generate even more electricity. This, uh, this uh, gas turbine generated around 20 megawatts. This one generated, generates around uh, 15 megawatts, and this one generates around 5 megawatts. And our goal was to try to maximize the amount of energy of electricity produced and not only that, to avoid and lose losses of steam, typically by venting, or also by letting down directly steam. Any, any ton of steam that you let down through direct let down valves is a ton of steam that you're not using for generating electricity. So the issues we found there were that the refinery steam production and demand was always in constant imbalance. That network was never in real balance. That led to a lot of offsets, which turned into high venting, high direct letdown from uh, high pressure to medium pressure, from medium pressure to low pressure. Extremely fast process dynamics. Typically, boilers respond very fast to any change you do on them. And that was the case here. The process was changing really fast. And so the offsets in the network were not offsets that you could react to in one or two minutes. The offsets in the network, you need to react to them really fast. If you don't do that, then you will quickly find uh, situations in which the only option you have is probably venting. Uh, they commonly used let, direct letdowns, as just, I just said, those for direct letdowns, those letdown valves uh, are, in general, losses in power generation. So, which one was our approach to this problematic? First of all, we, in our APC MPC solution, took care of both the high pressure and the low pressure network pressures, uh, which meant that we broke the cascade, to say it some way. We, as, 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 as the, our MPC solution was the one controlling the pressure of the networks. Uh, this was very important since the pressure of the network was altered by several uh, different um, several different sources. As we just saw, we had, uh, let's back a bit, let's go back here. So the cogenerator was generating steam, also the auxiliary boiler was generating steam. Any changes you did on the amount of uh, electricity generated here 
change the amount of, of steam generated, any changes done on the amount of uh, electricity you generated here, change the, the, the pressure of the network. So lots of contributors to the unbalance. So that's why we decided to con dynamically control both the pressures. For doing that, we had to uh, configure the MPC solution very fast. It was a very fast control response. The execution time was set to 10 seconds. Also, we make use of the feed forward action, of a feed forward action that you can typically have in the MPC solutions. In this case, what we did was uh, we had as inputs to our MPC solution, the steam demand, which we had measure of, and the external production, which we also had measure of. So we could, in advance, react to any changes in steam demand and external production, as well as fuel gas composition, as is typically a good uh, practice in the case of boilers. And we also, use the power generation, you know, the power of the turbines as handles in our MPC solution. In order to maximize them, we were always adjusting them for them to uh, generate the exact amount of electricity they could at that specific time. That also helped in the dynamic control of the pressures. The results are evident. Before the MPC solution was implemented, this is the fuel gas to the cogeneration boiler. This fuel gas flow here. As you see here, the fuel gas consumption was uh, a lot higher. Uh, this fuel gas consumption was around uh, 1,100 cubic meters per hour and then it was reduced to an average of 800. The low pressure network, the low, the low yeah, dual pressure steam network was uh, pretty much not, con not under control. The pressure was uh, just floating. And after we implemented our solution, we were able to tightly control that pressure, which also led to benefits in the downstream operations. Uh, by changing the power on the turbines and adjusting them to just get the right amount, we were both maximize, maximizing the amount of uh, power there and reducing the direct letdown. As you see, before the MPC solution was implemented, lots of direct letdown was happening. But after the MPC solution, we really managed to minimize the amount of uh, steam lost in direct letdown. So with that project, we concluded that even for very fast process dynamics, which is not a typical example for MPC solutions, uh, MPC is still a very good candidate and can provide a proper control and good optimization. That's it for now. Hope I have raised the uh, questions on you. Uh, thank you, Juan, and um, thank you, everyone, for Listening in, please submit your questions through the chat window if you have any. Uh, and while you're thinking about that, a um, few other administrative items. Um, we can issue you a short-term evaluation license of our PID tuning software. We talked about in, inter-aptitune, um, but also we have an inter-PID tuner, um, both these PID tuning technologies are available from IPCOS, and uh, we are more than happy to issue you a trial license. Please send us a request through our email, which is info at, e at ipcos.com. Um, also, we have the, the second example, which is the NPC example. We have um, um, a case study available which can also be emailed to you, and I believe it's also available on our website to be downloaded, uh, which has, uh, the, the case study has a lot more information about 
um, the benefits, etc., that were achieved by this application. I have a few questions that have come in. Um, um, we have in our uh, software coming up uh, uh, a functionality which is um, to do with cascade loops. Um, and the question was, um, when will it be available and how does it work? Um, I can I can answer that question. Basically, the um, cascade loop functionality will be available sometime next year, and it will allow you to tune loops, uh, obviously that are in cascade, um, and that will be coming up. And uh, we will obviously put out a, a, a press release and also do a, a webinar at, uh, at the time closer when we are ready to release that functionality. Uh, there's a question here, Juan. Um, how can you um, can you use AptiTune to 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 take care of boiler interactions, uh, for example, tuning drum levels? Uh, yes, yes, you can use AptiTune to for for drum levels because one of the good things of uh, AptiTune is that it uses a uh, state-of-the-art uh, process identification algorithm and with that you can easily identify the typical inverse response that you see in levels of, of boilers which uh, will be taken into account when tuning it and also uh, with it will take into account the interaction that you will have with any other variables in the boiler because uh, this is a multivariable approach to the PID tuning, so every single input that affects your level can be taken into account in our AptiTune software, which uh, will then result in an optimal tuning, not only of the level, but also on the interacting uh, loops related to it. Okay, thank you. We have another exa question. Do we have some examples of implementation of MPC on complex control loops related to urea or ammonia fertilizer plants? Yes. Yes, 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 we have. We have indeed. Um, MPC, we have used our own technology vastly in uh, fertilizer plants. In the specifically with our customer Yara, which is a very good customer of us, we have a very long relationship with Yara, and uh, we have done several MPC projects with Yara regarding to fertilizer processes, uh, ammonia, uh, nitric acid, ammonium nitrate. Uh, I mean. In general, we have covered the whole range of uh, operations in fertilizer industry. Even the even the granulation processes, we have done NPC projects. Okay, thank you. And and if you require any specific information regarding that, please feel free to email us, and we can send you uh, quite a lot of information. Uh, we have another question here. How do the savings relate? that come from base layer optimization and to MPC percent-wise? Um, maybe I can answer that question. I think the base layer optimization can give you a certain level of savings. Uh, in our example there, obviously, the reduction in oxygen results in a good amount of savings. Um, in the, sorry, the re reduction in excess oxygen will result in some efficiency gains and hence some savings. However, um, if you have multiple uh, boilers or you have a complex steam network, like the second example showed, then really you need a multivariable uh, control algorithm which will then adjust quickly based on demand uh, from the process side, uh, you know, various variables. I, I would say base layer optimization might give you kind of 20 to 30% of the benefits, and then you know, if you're looking for really maximizing your benefits, then the rest, 70%, 80% of the benefits will come from MPC. 
but it really depends on the complexity of your particular problem. Uh, we have another question here. I would like to know what variables have you used for the feed forward? Was it actual flow rate of steam production slash demand? Yes, yes it was. Uh, we we had uh, the the demand, the demand flows pretty much. That was what we had uh, on the DCS. We were lucky enough to have them all on the DCS. So we we summed them all up, all the demand flows. We summed them all up. So we considered all those as a single feed-forward variable. And we also then had a second uh, feed-forward variable, which was the production was the production um, uh, feed forward variable. In that case, of course, we took into account only the external sources of steam because there were external sources of steam in this case. Uh, there was a, a CO boiler in the FCC unit. It was a refinery in which we were working at. Uh, they also had uh, contracts with external steam providers those flows uh, we took into account. We, again, summed them up and took them into account. As you may imagine, we didn't use as feed forwards the steam generated by the boilers themselves because we were controlling that flow. So it was not, a, it was, uh, not independent from the MPC to be considered, considered as a feed forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question here. How do you minimize disturbance on downstream users when you carry out step test? Um, basically, in brackets, risk of units shutdown. Yeah, this is this is interesting. The good thing about this uh, about this is that as long as you don't move too much the pressure on the on the network, you will not disturb uh, the oper the downstream operations. Well, what I mean with this is you can you you will also need to step a lot of other variables that will affect the performance of the boiler, but not necessarily the pressure of the steam network. And if you have to do it, as it was the case for us in our in our experience in Italy, what you do is uh, since this response very fast and the behavior of uh, the pressures in the networks is typically. Uh, a ramp-like behavior, the only thing you really need is to make it, let's say, oscillate a bit uh, more than what it usually oscillates, but not too much. You can still keep uh, safe limits. You don't, you don't need to make the, the, the steam pressure vary more than one bar, if we're talking bars. In, in our specific example, uh, the set pressure for that high pressure steam network was something around 48, 49 bars, if I recall correctly. And none of our tests, the pressure was more than 50 bar or lower than 48 bar. We always kept those limits and we, and we managed to find very good, nice models with those. It's just a matter of uh, yeah, uh, doing it with enough care to not disturb the operations downstream. Okay, thank you, Juan. Uh, another question here. Can you handle startup shutdown and ramping in the APC system? And regarding ramping, what range can be covered? Well, uh, MPC solutions are not designed for startup or shutdown of units. So no, it's not recommended to use it for that. And with regards to ramping, well, I guess if you're already inside your typical operating region, but you're probably at the lower end, then since at that point uh, the MPC solution is is applicable, then you can uh, uh, use some tuning of the application to help with the ramping. But only if you really are on the typical operating range of your unit. Any other case is not recommended to use MPC. Okay. Um, then we have a question here. How long does it take to implement uh, an MPC on boilers project on a boilers uh, on a steam network? 
Well, it all comes down to how much, how, how good the instrumentation is, how and how good the base layer control is, because uh, the MPC solution will be based on on that, on how good both instrumentation and the base layer control is. So, if you have a very good uh, base layer system, is well set up, everything is working properly. Well. I guess in something like three or four months, you can already see the benefits of an implemented emphasis solution. Okay. And we have another question coming here. Is the MPC system uh, is a program or is it a combination of controllers? How actually uh, does it do the optimization of the process? So this is a very interesting question. It is, it is a program. I mean, it is not a combination of controllers. It's a truly multivariable controller uh, having several inputs and several outputs. And uh, it, does, it has built in uh, an optimization um, objective. What I mean with this is uh, when, you, when we configure our program, our MPC software, or whichever MPC software, uh, is used. You need to configure the objective, fun objective function of the optimization. So that's how it is, is done. It has an objective function. That objective function gives you targets, and then uh, the system has uh, all the dynamics inside. It knows all the dynamics to take the process from its current condition to the optimal condition as this as dictated by the optimizer. So it is a whole package by itself. And Works it, are working on top of the DCS. It's a higher layer, higher layer of control. And it uh, I'll just add to that and say it, it sends the MPC system sends set points to the DCS. Um, so you send simultaneous set points, for example, every 10 seconds or 30 seconds to a number of PID controllers, and that's how it actually controls the, the process. Okay, um, there's another question here. Is the MPC software easily um, integrable in an Aspen ecosystem, for example, IP21? Uh, are there any perks in purchasing your solution instead of Aspen's? Um, I can take that question. The uh, IP, obviously, it costs MPC solution is um, independent in terms of the technology. Uh, it is not, cannot be integrated uh, with an Aspen Tech solution. Um, it, obviously, if you're looking at IP21, which is a database, then you could um, get the, the tags and and populate them in the IP21 historian. Uh, I guess that's true for any any tags that are outside of um, IP outside of the Aspen ecosystem could be imported into IP21, created and, and the data historized. Uh, in terms of perks of purchasing our solution, well, I, I, I don't know if there's any significance from a purely solu mathematical solution point of view if the APC systems that are out there, including Aspen's hours and, and other companies, if there really is mathematically a difference in how the solution works, is really in the implementation and the services that are um, that make the difference. And as an independent service provider, we work with Aspen technology as well as ours, so uh, and, and also other technologies like Smock. And really, we feel that where we add value is really on the service side and the, the knowledge and the experience we have on the service side. Um, customers are free to choose whichever technology they like. Obviously, we would like you to purchase our technology. Um, but if you have a choice that you made because of corporate reasons or whatever other reasons, then we can work with whichever technology you have chosen for APC. Okay, um, I think we'll take um, maybe one or two more questions and then we will end the session. Um, there's a question here, 
how does this compare to RTO on Steam networks? How does this compare to oh, real-time optimization? Yeah, yes, of course. It, it's a very good question. Um, well, in this case, and every MPC solution, not only ours, but also Aspen Tech ones uh, and uh, Shell ones and Honeywell solution, all of those, they are, in general, built for uh, doing linear optimization. There's, uh, for all of those cases, all of those, there's always the assumption of uh, process linearity uh, on, which it, on which they all are based. So the optimization that can be achieved with any MPC software will be uh, on, on a linear range, which means that if you have some sort of RTO uh, solution, you can integrate it with um, you can integrate it with with the MPC solution, meaning that now then the optimization will not be linear, will be uh, more uh, let's say much more sounded optimization, um, very very theoretical even optimization that will be done, and then that the result from the from the optimizer from the RTO can then be uh, sent to the MPC solution for the MPC solution to take the process to that RTO part. Uh, I would say that, yes, that will give additional benefit, but if we're talking about percentage, I would say that still a linear optimization will give you the 80% of the, of, the, of the benefit you can achieve. And if you have an RTO on top of that, well, then you will have probably 20% additional benefit. The case, the specific case of RTOs for uh, steam boilers, uh, most of them, what they do is the is, is the optimization of the efficiency of the boilers because there's a real optimum related to the excess oxygen you uh, with which you work on the on the boiler. So, yeah, I mean, it's this is just something special, some special calculations you need to do there. But in general, you can get very near to the real optimum just with MPC. Okay, thank you very much. I think we will close the session here. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us. You can follow us on uh, Twitter. And also the next webinar will be announced uh, at the link that you see on the screen. Please also feel free to send us your suggestions on topics that you would like us to cover in future webinars. We will be very happy to take your um, suggestions into account when we are doing the next uh, set of webinars. And thank you again for your time. We appreciate you um, coming online for this webinar.